Now, I would say woe to any Christian couple or any Christian individual who's seeking to be married, young or old, that does not have uh, a spiritual radar. Because if you ought to be attracted to anything, it ought to be what's under the hood. Not how shiny the wheels are and, you know, the color. No, all that stuff can be changed, and it will change. But what's under the hood actually makes it work. And when it comes to relationships, Christian relationships, it's, a rela- it's our relationship with Jesus Christ that actually makes the relationship continue and to, be, uh, to have success. Um, and that's, that's, that's something we need to keep in our mind. So as we look at um, what the scriptures say, God made marriage and he made it on purpose because he's the one overseeing how we hook up and who we hook up with. Husbands, are the both, husbands and wives are both uh, important in marriage. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 11. Turn over it with me. We're going to flip through some pages. I meant to put some of these on the screen. I do have a couple listed here, but I want us to turn to the other ones. First Corinthians 11 and verse 11. Someone read that verse for us, if you will. Okay, now you have a King James Version. All right, I have a new King James. It says, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor a woman independent of man in the Lord. Okay, uh, and this speaks on both sides. Okay, both are equally important uh, in marriage. Okay, the husbands, husbands and wives are both important in marriage. This is not a scenario where Uh, The husband, even though he's the head of the home, let's put that back in this biblical context. That's responsibility. That's not the husband being more important than the wife. Big old husband and a little old, you know, insignificant wife. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, It is a equal partnership in this regard. The husband is just as important as the wife is under God. The husband has responsibilities, as does the wife have responsibilities. And both of those are equally as important under God. Okay? So there's a balance that God creates in initially in how he created marriage. Um, and again, that covering scenario is not lording over. It is actually protecting. Again, we go back to our perfect example. Jesus is our covering. He does not lord over us. In other words, even in this regard, he doesn't make us do anything. We're not, we're not, even though Paul says we're, we're slaves of Christ, uh, this is a whole new system what, of what we know of slavery or being connected to, you know, uh, uh, submissive. That word submissive would be uh, uh, attributed to a slave, someone who has to be submissive under someone else's authority. Um, but it is a joy in a spiritual context. It is a joy to submit to the lordship of Christ. Because the leadership, the lordship, the results of submitting to God only bring blessings on our lives. It's never a scenario where we submit to God and we come up short. It's never a scenario where we we are obedient to God, we deny ourselves and we follow Jesus and we find out it wasn't worth it. That never happens. Because the blessings that God has for those who actually submit to him are out of this world. No good thing will he withhold to those who walk upright. Uh, He'll supply all of our needs. I mean, there's so many blessings that are waiting to uh, overtake us. Psalm 23, goodness and mercy following you. You Because submission under God's umbrella of protection is always a doorway to blessing. We have bought into a carnal, with a, a, a carnal, um, a, a deviated version, perverted ber- version of submission, and it's become it's come about because of the evil of mankind, slavery. Well, you're purchasing someone that you devalued to do a slave job or to have hard work and labor so that 
you can be lazy and you can put the pressure on somebody else to do what you ought to do for yourself while you lord over them, while you demean them, while you put them down, while you call them less than a human, while you, do, uh, you beat them, you have sex with them. You, you, uh, come on, that's what slavery was. And in many regards still is in those parts of the world where those are still in that system. That's what it is. But under God's view of submission, it was never to hurt. It was always to help. It was always to bless. It was always to make sure that you are safe. Okay? So the covering from a husband to a wife is to be that of a gracious, loving protection. Okay? Not lording over, not belittling, not making to feel inferior, not to make you feel stupid. And it's not, and, and, and I say that, it's not, even in our culture today, it's not just a husband scenario towards a wife. Sometimes it's the wife towards the husband. You get the same type of personality on both sides. And God says, that's not my design because one is not to lord over the other. One is not to demean and belittle the other. One is not to assume uh, a position that God never gave you in this thing called marriage. It is to be uh, equally respected and equally taken seriously from the husband and the wife as God has given instructions to both. So uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 11 just lays it out and makes it very even. And, and this verse actually knocks out of the water uh, this femi- uh, feminist movement that was started years ago. It, it just knocks it out of the water because uh, it, it, whether you go on that side or the male chauvinistic side, which reads all kinds of you know uh, uh, male uh, advantages or husband advantages uh, in Scripture that are not there, okay? Uh, we have equal footing before God, but we have different roles and functions that God draws a distinction between. And he doesn't do that, he doesn't do that uh, uh, lightly. He does so on purpose because there's certain things he expects the man to be in the husband, in the, as a husband and he, certain things he expects a wife to be. And both have to learn how to be that. It doesn't come natural. But that's the joy and that's the purpose of a lifelong relationship. Why? Because it takes a lifelong to learn. It doesn't happen after a month. It doesn't happen after a meeting. It doesn't happen after a counseling session. It happens lifelong when we grow and, and, and continue to grow into this type of understanding uh, that God wants us to model. Because, again, the overall overarching uh, purpose of this long term is so that the unbelieving world can see how God affects, organizes, and blesses our homes so that they can be attracted, there's that word again, not to us, but to the one who's keeping us together. You see what I'm saying? There's three adults, husband, wife, and God. And that's why the scripture says what God has joined together. He does the joining. They are together because of God putting them together. And the world needs to see what a product, a marriage product looks like uh, after God has been involved in it. That's the difference between us and the unbelieving couple. They don't look to God as their glue. They don't look to God as the one that keeps them and holds them and gives them the security they need. They don't look to God for that. They look to each other. Some make it. Some don't. But God has designed this thing for believing couples to understand and have an understanding early on of what makes this thing actually work. Okay? So husband and wives are both important. Number, uh, letter C, marriage is designed to meet our needs by being, and I'm going to list a couple things here. Number one, the primary relationship. The primary relationship. Relationship. When I say primary, it's the most important. It's not one of the most important. It is the most important. When we talked about that earlier, Paul said, uh, you know, well, if you want to marry, do so. But understand, your wife or your husband is going to be your first priority. Okay? Then the Lord. Not, not that we don't put God first in our lives, but when we talk about on a horizontal level, 
your first responsibility is that spouse that God gave you. Okay, not your job, not anybody else, not friends, not your buddies that you've known for 20 years. No, there has to be a line that's drawn and where you submit now to what God says is the primary uh, uh, relationship in your, in your life. Many struggle right there. Many people struggle right there. And many relationships don't make it because people don't know how to draw friendly lines. Uh, boundaries, that's really what it is. It's a boundary. Because um, they want to hold on to those friendships, relationships, uh, connections that they have been used to all their lives. And when you get married, uh, things change. Things and things ought to change. You can't continue on with the same uh, relationships being in the same order and order priority. Your priorities change. Your first, of, uh, first and fourth, foremost commitment now is to your spouse and meeting those needs. Being what God said now you're joined together to be, husband and wife. So there is a, a change that takes place as this is the primary relationship. God didn't make parents for Adam and Eve. Notice that. We don't find that. He didn't make parents for Adam and Eve. He made, that wasn't a relationship they needed. Okay? He made them husband and wife. Because that's the relationship that God knew they needed. Okay? He made them husband and wife. Not uh, on any other close earthly relationship. Matter of fact, what does the Bible say about, hu- uh, about husbands and wives in relationships to parents? They should leave father and mother, and the two should become one flesh. There's a leaving, cleaving, and being. Okay, And that's really what takes place in a godly marriage. You leave that family structure that you're used to, that that developed you, that birthed you, that got you to where you are. Not saying it's not important, but it's not is is now not the most important one in your in your life. You know, God will take care of mama. God will take care of daddy. But you've got a new priority, and that's your new family, your husband or your wife. So uh, it's the primary relationship. Uh, secondly, it's the permanent relationship. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19 and 6. When you find that, someone read that for us, if you will. Okay. They are to be permanent because God has joined them together. They ought to be permanent because God has joined them together. That's important to understand. That's how serious God views what he created. Okay? And let me parallel that. Just like God took creation of the world and the, and, and the universe, everything that is, uh, just as he took his creation seriously, okay, uh, he's just as serious about his creation of marriage. Now I say that because creation has been infected by sin, Satan, but yet... Uh, he still blesses creation. Seasons still come and go. Sun still rises and sets. The stars still do their thing. The 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 gal, you know the universe still has its orbit and the planets and the stars. All these they still do what God. These things are untouched by sin. They still do what God originally designed them to do. Okay, so there are some things. That didn't stop because sin came into the picture. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, we do see the effects of sin in our culture. But there are some things that continue as God originally designed. Because God is saying, ah, even though Satan might cause this, this, but he's not going to shut down the whole thing. I'm not going to let him do that. Because I'm still the creator and I'm still in love with my creation. And that's why Jesus came, died for the creation, so that we might get back in fellowship with him and get this thing on the right foot again. So God is committed just that, just that much in marriage. Marriage will face challenges and trouble uh, that will try to separate, try to break up, try to end what God has joined together. But this verse makes it very clearly God's design for the permanency of marriage. He says, uh, you're no longer two, but one. One. 
one. You cannot separate one. You can't divide one. Okay, we're not half. We're whole before the Lord. He's made us whole. And in, in relationship, in marriage, he makes that, that those two different individuals, think about two different people, two different names, come from two different backgrounds, two different uh, experiences, two different mindsets, uh, ideas, persuasions, habits, uh, choices, whatever it might be. And he takes two totally different people and puts them together and says, now you are one. I don't, when I look at you, I don't see two different people. I see one. Just as Jesus declared, I and my father are one. Again, we go back to our greatest example, our, our perfect example. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, three, but yet one. And they always function. Again, our example of how to be different in function, but, 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 but to come back at the end of the day and say, you know, we're one. You know, we're, we're not at odds with each other. We're not, we're, you know, we, we function as one. Okay? And that's important for us to understand when we talk about marriage, the oneness of marriage because it's meant to be permanent, meant to be permanent. He's removed the two and now refers to us and looks at us as one. Uh, and he says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, that would also include uh, internal, husband and wife included. We don't have the right to separate what God has joined together, nor does someone outside of the marriage have the right to step into the marriage and to cause division. Okay? That's why, again, there's a verse we just mentioned, uh, husband and wife leave father and mother and get away and become one. Sort of like what God did with Abraham, leave your father, leave your home, and go to a land that I'll show you because I need to get you by yourself. But what I'm about to do in your life, I need you by yourself so you can really learn only from me. And what God says in marriage is, Leave father and mother. Those relationships will get in the way if you let them remain. I always say this, even if a marriage couple, look, if they're struggling, let them struggle. But they need to be able to work through that struggle by themselves. We can't help them with that. We'll ruin them. If a baby chicken or bird, you know, has to get out of that shell if you and I try to help that bird by cracking the shell, we'll ruin that bird because that bird needs to struggle. That bird needs that experience of breaking through that, 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 that shell that has housed that bird since birth. And now he's coming out or she's coming out into life having the strength to make it continuously through life. If you help that bird, you will weaken that bird because that bird needs the pressure, needs the stress. That's healthy pressure. It's healthy for him to struggle, struggle, and then finally make it. If they can get through that, they can continue to make it through the rest of life. If we don't allow young couples to make those stressful decisions, to work through those stressful, painful situations, they will never learn how to stand on their own feet and actually be successful in marriage. Be there to support them from a distance. But here's the thing. Leaving is biblical. They have to have their own space in order to understand how this thing works. Let them fall. Let them make mistakes. But if they're actually committed to God, God will not let them utterly fall. Because God is the one that's going to be there to pick them up. And that's what they need to understand. Just like all of us in all of our relationships, in, in our own relationship with God, God lets us fall sometimes. That's why it says, if you confess your sins. Why? Because you're going to have sin. You're going to make wrong choices. You're going you're to you're gonna go the wrong way. So here's the thing. When you do mess up, catch the rope. I'll help you stand back up. I'm not going to make your decisions for you because that ain't my job. And that ain't your position as a child. Make your decisions. Learn from the fall. Learn from the fall. And that's for all of us. It's not, falling is not the issue. God knows every, everybody human is going to fall. Falling is not the issue. It's a matter of do you learn from the fall? 
Do you learn from the experience of being out of God's will? Do you learn from, from having fellowship broken with God? Do you learn from messing up a relationship? Do you learn from saying the wrong thing and you can't take it back? Do you learn? That's the issue. Do we learn from messing up in relationships, whether it be with God or whether it be with other friends or whether it be with a husband and wife? The issue is, what have we learned? Because God allows us to mess up so we can grow up. He allows us to mess up so we can grow up. So the struggle is important. Uh, while God still declares that uh, we are to be one flesh and no one is to separate. Failure doesn't separate. Pain doesn't separate. Uh, uh, um, hurt doesn't separate. Why? Because God says, I made you one. And I did that so that, see, you can separate two. Go that way, go that way. But one, how are you going to separate that? They got to be together because that's how God made them. So it's ironic. It's, it's, it's actually important that we understand why he refers to us as one as a married couple. Okay? A lot of times today, we don't see that. We don't see that. We're thinking individualistically. Husbands are thinking, well, here's what I want. Wives are thinking, here's what I want. And then, and then the, the, the saddest thing is that we get around other people that think individualistically and who don't think biblically. I hate to hear people talking and giving carnal advice to folk who are impressionable and who will eat it up as if it's the right choice. I really, I mean, I'm just like saying, you keep your mouth shut. Stop spewing out your own emotional uh, ideas because of your own uh, anger and 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 and, and uh, you know being upset. No, don't don't pass that poison on to somebody else. It's going to do nothing but ruin them. And many times, because of our own failure, we have come up with our own version of what is right, and we're passing it on to the next generation. No, receive healing for yourself, whether it be separation, whether it be divorce, whether it be uh, uh, maybe the loss of a loved one, and now you can't make amends with whatever happened years ago. Whatever the situation is, receive the healing of God for your life for your situation, and then those that come along in your life, God still calls us to come back to what God says about how he designed marriage to function. That's how we're to pass wisdom on. We're not to pass our own emotions on. We're not to pass uh, uh, what we think. And, you know, well, child, you know, this ain't a Medea type situation. <laughs> if he says that you take that pan of grits, and, you know, no, that ain't God. That's good television, but that ain't God. We're called to be biblical. Why? Because we're influencing another generation on this thing called marriage. And marriage, many, you've heard the statistics, uh, many times uh, uh, marriage is, uh, divorce is more common within Christian marriages, and many don't make it past three to five years, if that. Again, because of attraction to the wrong thing, and they get in and find out reality, and they're not so attracted to that. Heard the story of the wife who, you know, husband and wife got married, and all the husband was just, oh, so excited about his wife, and she's just so beautiful, and she's just, oh, she's just this, it's looking, and I just love her, I love her, and she's just beautiful, beautiful, just beautiful, beautiful. Married her, got home, and she started taking off stuff. <laughs> Eyelashes, and, 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 and and hair and wig and, and yeah, teeth came out and and, and you know and, and, and makeup came off. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and reality set in, and and you know he didn't like reality. Whoa, you're not the one I saw, you know, uh, because you know we need to understand this is there has to be something deeper than. Than that, that keeps us together as married couples. Uh, it's a reality that God has joined us together. And God's not about division. Anything about scripture, you know about this. He's not about division. Even, even as we look at Abraham, he multiplied his blessings. His covenant was a covenant of multiplication. Yeah, it wasn't about division. Uh, Satan comes to divide. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's division. 
He comes to take away. God comes to give. Okay? So, um, it's a permanent relationship. Thirdly, it's an exclusive relationship. Uh, we talked about polygamy. Uh, but being having one wife, one spouse, is God's design. Even though he tolerated uh, polygamy. His job, his, his design is that there's one man, one woman. Okay? All right, flip over. Paul said, let me hit this heat. All right, real quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. An intimate relationship. Okay, an intimate relationship. Sex is designed for marriage. 1 Corinthians 6, 16. Someone have that? Now, again, Paul uses an extreme here to illustrate how true God's boundary is or standard is for marriage uh, or what takes place within a marriage, which is this conjugal relationship, sexual relations between a husband and wife. He says, uh, even, in, even when this is taken outside of marriage, even when it's misused, the same truth still happens. What's the truth in the text? That they become one flesh, one body, okay? There is a joining together in conjugal relationship. There's a joining together in sexual uh, relations between a man and a woman, okay? And God says that doesn't stop just because you misuse it. And that's why sex outside of marriage is so dangerous. And I mean any kind of sex, okay? I'm talking freely tonight because... We live in a world that has created all kinds of options. And they say, well, because, you know, it wasn't, you know, uh, traditional sex that it's okay. You know, foreplay or doing other kind of sexual acts that, that are just as uh, awakening as what Scripture says uh, sex produces. Okay? That's why it's reserved for the marriage bed. The Bible says the... Uh, uh, the marriage bed is undefiled, okay? No shame there because what God designed uh, and the freedom that God designed between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, is to be w- without restrictions in that uh, category. Now, be, be, beware. Outside of that category, uh, there are consequences, but there are no consequences when it's done within the boundaries of marriage. It is a blessed, holy thing. It's the, it's the way God designed um, so that's important. Sex was designed for marriage, and it was designed for the express, express purpose of uh, p- procreation. God desired there to be some results from marriage, and that would be generations, uh, but also for enjoyment. Okay, husband and wives meeting that need. That's one need among many. Okay, sin always hinders intimacy, even in marriage. Okay. I want you to understand that because, again, as we talk about the success of marriage and the breakdown of marriage, it always goes back to sin. Sin breaks down fellowship. Marriage, even though it's the most closest part of intimacy, uh, it is still considered fellowship, man, woman, fellowshipping together in this intimate way. Sin breaks fellowship. Think about Adam and Eve when they... Um, sin, the Bible says that they what? They hit themselves. They hit themselves. Let me, uh, I, don't know, I don't think we normally look at it this way, but I want you to think really deep about this. Twofold. They hit themselves from God, apparently, of course. That's who he's talking to them. They're running, hiding. But also from themselves. Think about that. Because sin affects all relationships, fellowship, 
we have fellowship with God. We also have fellowship with each other. And at that point, that's when there was a rift between Adam and Eve. The results of sin. Don't think that they were buddy-buddy like they were before they sinned. No. No, no, not at all. Marriage took on a new face with both of them after this point. Also between them and God. So they hid themselves from God. They also hid themselves emotionally from each other. The Bible says they were ashamed of their nakedness. Okay? Their, their nakedness. So who's looking at them? They're looking at each other. Okay? That's not necessarily God. You know, yeah, they might have been ashamed because of guilt now setting in, but they're also having to deal with this relationship and their earthly relationship. Guilt, shame, right here. So there's a breakdown in marriage initially. Okay? But it's designed to be an intimate relationship. That's why it's important that marriages and married couples deal with uh, sin, uh, deal with uh, things that cause division. How do you work through problems? How do you work through pain? How do you work through uh, disappointment? How do you work through when you've been hurt, when you just flat out, you've just been hurt, you know, and things didn't happen the way it should have happened, and now one spouse is wounded. What, what do you do? That happens more often than we actually probably testify about. You know, a lot of folk in church going through issues, wounds, hurts, pains, scars. How do you deal with that? God has a way and always has had a way for Christian couples to navigate through these challenges. Forgetting it is not the answer. Forgetting it is not dealing with it. Brushing it under the rug and saying it wasn't that big of a deal and moving on is not dealing with it. Okay? Because sin needs to be dealt with. Jesus didn't say forget about your sins and move on. Think the best of yourself. He said, if you confess it, if you deal with it to me, if you bring it to me, you don't ignore it, bring it to me, acknowledge it, bring it to me, get it right with me, and then receive what I have for you to cover it so you can actually move on. That's the only way you move on. You deal with it. Marriage, married couples have to deal with challenges, pain, hurt, offense, whatever it might be. Deal with it. Because, again, going back to 1 Corinthians, um, uh, what was it? 1 Corinthians 11, 11, both are equally important. So therefore, listen carefully, both are equally uh, privileged to speak about those issues. If you're in a marriage or if you know someone in a marriage or a young couple that, might, that are going into and there is not a freedom between both to be transparent and honest, then it is an unhealthy relationship. We've got to understand how God views this thing. The man is responsible to listen to his wife that's loving. The wife is responsible for communication with her husband that is respectful and honoring in nature, but it does not shut down dealing with real life issues. Somewhere along the line, we have bought into this thing that if I'm respecting you, I'm not, on, I'm not verbally honest. Or if something's offensive to you, then I just should, should keep quiet. And that's not Bible. Because the Bible says challenges happen, struggles happen, but listen, both have the responsibility to speak freely as long as we're doing it in a Christ-honoring way, loving and respecting. But we're not to, to shy away from controversy just because something is controversial, just because something is hard to deal with or hard to talk about. That's what a lot of, a lot of Christians, for the sake of trying to be biblical in a human sort of way, sort of brush it under the rug, forget about it, live with it, move on, and you haven't really moved on because healing of hurt and pain can't happen until you deal with it. We can't get forgiven from God and actually receive it and walk in it until we bring it to him. So if that's what we do to our Heavenly Father, then that's what our Heavenly Father expects us to do towards one another. Okay, this is biblical marriage. It's not easy. But this is what God says. It's an intimate relationship, and that intimacy, that intimacy leads to a freedom. 
sin leads to bondage, but intimacy and, and the way God designed it leads to freedom. We're free in Christ. All these scriptures talk about how free we are in Christ. It's because our sin has been taken away. It's not because we're right. In, no, our sin has been taken away. And now we have freedom. We're at, we're, we, we don't have that anymore. We actually can experience true freedom in our relationship with God. When we deal with sin in our marriage, in our home, we experience and we unleash the power of the Holy Spirit to free us so we can, for the first time, deal and live with uh, this freedom and liberty that God has designed all along for us. This is God's word. And let me say this to you. If you're dealing with a spouse that doesn't want to hear what God has to say or doesn't want to adhere to the truth of God's word, it doesn't stop you from still doing it. Because if you get it out, release it, do it God's way, you're not responsible for the other party. And let me speak to the wives here for a minute. If that is a burden to you and a hindrance to you from doing and saying what is right before God, and I'm not saying uh, being obnoxious and out of line, but simply it's taking a stand on what scripture says. Let me tell you something. You release your husband to God's care. And God will deal with him. Likewise, husband towards a wife that won't hear, release that spouse to God. And let God deal with them. But it should not stop us on either side from saying what God says. From lining up where God says it, tells us to stand. And how we should deal with this. Okay. Because God has a way of bringing relationships as it, all it takes is one that wants to honor the Lord. All it takes is one. Because God will take that faith from the one and, and do miracles in that scenario. But if both step outside and say, you know what, I'm, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. God's saying, I need somebody. I need to work through somebody. Somebody to trust me to fix this thing. Step out. Who, like a Peter. I mean, you're going, you, I need somebody to get out of the boat. And actually trust me with this thing. Walk by faith in this area. Many times we shout and praise God over superficial stuff and go back to hard stuff that hadn't changed in years. No, trust God for that stuff. Because God, if God can supply your need over here and bless you, and yeah, he can do the same thing in that hard area. This is deep. It's designed to be a Christian relationship, lastly. 2 Corinthians 6.14 do not be mis... I'm, 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 I'm reading from the Holman Standard Christian Bible. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Okay? Now, I put this last. It ought to be first. Because in our culture today, especially among our young people, if they're not well-versed in the Scripture and don't have a strong commitment to the Lord, let me tell you something. The enemy is going to tempt them. I can tell you this is going to be the first area of temptation. To step outside of God's will, first and foremost, by selecting a mate who doesn't know Jesus. And I can't begin to tell you how popular that is among church kids. Kids that have been raised in the church. Kids have been raised in Christian homes. And they go off, get grown, just like prodigal son, go out and they do whatever they want to do. But it's not based on what God says. We need to understand what God says about the origin and how this thing actually gets started. Everything else really is built upon this principle. Is your marriage a Christian marriage? Okay? Now, we're not talking about uh, where you're married as unbelievers and you got saved, your spouse didn't. That's a whole different category. God has something else to say about that. But when it comes down to starting... On, on the same level, God says, don't go into something that's not my will. Marriage is designed biblically to be Christian in nature. Uh, he says some very important things here in this verse. He says, don't be unequally yoked. That's King James. Uh, this verse says mismatched. That's probably a term that we can easily understand. Something that does not fit. Something that is not meant to fit. Something that is not meant to go together. It's mismatched. Okay? It's not paired up. It's not matched up. It's mismatched. And then he goes on to explain. He says, what partnership or fellowship is there between righteousness and lawlessness? 
They're extremes. They're not the same. You know, righteousness, a righteous standard versus sin and iniquity, that they're not the same. They're contrast. They're contrary. They're on e- uh, 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 different ends of this whole standard. Okay? Or, if that's not good enough, what fellowship? Now we're getting to a relationship term. What fellowship does light have with darkness? I think, what, again, these are simple illustrations that believers and non-believers can understand. What similarity does light, let's be scientific, what similarities are there with light and darkness? Absolutely nothing. They are different in every aspect, every area, on every level. They will never be the same or similar. No matter how much we will it to be, want it to be. No matter how, some, how, much, how much someone else has told us it can happen, it, they will never be the same. He says, just as those opposites will never attract, an unbeliever and a believer will never fit together. It's like trying to stuff a round peg through a square hole. I don't care how, many, how long you look at it, try to size it up and angle it just right, I can get it through that corner. No, this round edge will never become, it will never become that. I don't care how crafty you get to try to make it work. It, by design, will always be different. And what God is saying, the mar- and the way that I put marriage and created marriage and, and, and the blessing that I have attached on this thing for my children is only for my children. It will never work if you try to work it with somebody who's out of covenant. We go back to Abraham and Isaac now. The reason why Isaac and Rebekah are so distraught over Esau's choice is because Esau stepped outside of covenant that began with his granddaddy to choose somebody, uh, two pagan, not just one, two pagan wives, so he could do what he wanted to do and the way he wanted to do it. And, and, and it, it disturbed his parents because they understood what he was doing, whether he understood it or not. They understood this is not how God blesses. This is not how God will continue to bless. This is not how God operates. You did this because you wanted to do it, not because God told you. And God's saying the same thing today. If you want marriage to really work, you've got to stay in covenant. Your spouse, your choice has got to be in covenant because my blessing is to my children. My blessing is to those who actually know me, serve me, love me. Otherwise, it's light and darkness. It's righteousness and wickedness. You can't say they're the same. Okay? They're not equal. Now, he uses, King James uses the word yoke. We understand that. Uh, Look at Deuteronomy 22.10. You should not plow with an ox and a what? Can you please tell me what will happen if you try to do that? Mm -hmm. Now an ox, an ox will do what? Just by design, if we're talking about plowing and making progress, an ox? Huh? Good choice? Okay, yeah, yeah. But now you hook that ox with a donkey. Now I'm not sure what the King James English is. It might say another word for donkey. What will a donkey do? Slow down, sit down, go one way, pull. And a donkey is not trained. A donkey is not, does not have the same work ethic or ethic, ethics as an ox does. You put two oxen together and they will plow together. Because by design they know how to use that yoke and stay with it. And actually do something. A donkey does not have that understanding. And that donkey will never have that understanding. I don't care how much you train them. That donkey will always be a donkey. And God says, listen, you can't put two different things in nature. And expect it to come out right. Because the destiny or the destination will never be reached. Now here it is. 
an unsaved man with an unsaved woman or vice versa will never reach their destiny. Oh, they might have a beautiful marriage. They might have a, 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 a happy time together. They might have children. They might make money and live in a nice house and, all, and have everything the world calls success. But from God's perspective, they will never reach his intended destiny for them because one is not even going in the same direction. That donkey is pulling. And here's what happens. It's the reason why God says don't be unequally yoked because eventually the pull is going to become too much. And let me tell you who's going to be affected. It's going to be the Christian. The unsaved spouse is going to want to do, oh, here it is. The unsaved spouse is going to eventually get honest with themselves. They're going to get honest. I don't want to go to church. They get honest real quick. Out of nowhere. And you got to deal with it. Because the reality is set in their heart was never there with the Lord. The commitment was never with the, with the Lord. And now they're honest all of a sudden and you got to deal with it. And it's going to pull that believing spouse away from their commitment to the Lord. Which is the very place they need to be gravitating towards. It happens every time. I'll tell young people this and I'll tell them until I die. There's no such thing as missionary dating. Missionaries go on fields or wherever to win the loss. Our job, listen, in dating or courting, because this, that's a better term when you move towards uh, marriage, is select, the selection of a mate. You're serious about you know, moving this direction. Uh, is to understand that the result of this ought to be a godly union. And how we uh, pair ourselves up even in the dating phase or the courtship phase is still preparing for a selection in marriage. Now this is not just for young people because we got older folk that are dating. You know, all these dating sites and stuff on TV, people, you know, it happens. And people are doing it based upon their emotions. Well, I didn't get what I wanted on my first spouse, so I'm going to just go, I'm going to do it my way this time. I'm talking about Christians. It ain't biblical. It ain't biblical. It's unequally yoked. And it will lead to destruction of your first commitment to the Lord. Okay? Marriage for the believer is about destiny and eternity. Proverbs 18.22, a man who finds a wife finds a what? Good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. In this text, God is still involved in blessing the marriage. God wants to bless marriage. Isaac understood that. Rebecca understood that. They understood what it meant. They can go back on their own testimony, how God blessed their union, brought them together, and it was the hand of God that brought them together. They want the same thing for their children. We ought to want the same thing for our children, our children's children, so much so that we'll direct them back to what God says. Please, let's not take the soft approach because we don't want to hurt somebody's feeling. We need to say what God says while they're listening because there might come a day where they won't even be available to hear. Grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, whatever it might be, don't be ashamed in a in a, a loving Christ-like way to say everything God says because God still has us in the lives of those that are going this way to understand what God's will is. If they call themselves Christians, now they're not believers, don't spend time there. They need to be saved. But if they are saved, you give them every instruction from God's word on what re biblical relationships look like, biblical marriages look like, so that our young people adolescents, uh, young working adults, or even those that are further along in life actually have a biblical model, have a biblical understanding of what the Bible says so that they can actually do and make the right choice. It's important because it's designed to be uh, marriage that honors the Lord. All right, any questions?